blessings are good. Hope is wonderful. And the scripture says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, that we have a blessed hope. Now that sounds marvelous. And you know what? Our blessed hope is just that. It is wonderful. But unfortunately, many people reject what the scripture reveals concerning this blessed hope. Now, you may know it by another term. It is very common and popular for people to speak about the rapture. In fact, unfortunately today, more and more people are rejecting this idea of a blessed hope or a rapture. And one of the reasons that many people do so is because they say, well, it is not something that's mentioned in the Old Testament, and they're right. Nor is it something that Judaism acknowledges or speaks to, and that's true. Judaism does not. But we need to remember something. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says it is a mystery. And a mystery is something that, that does not appear in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. It is something that we find only mentioned in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. Therefore, we should not reject something because it's not found both in the Old and the New and just found in the New. That's why Paul called it a mystery. Now, something else that I'd like to say concerning our blessed hope is that many people who accept the reality of it are confused by it. So we're going to spend two studies, this video and the next, in order to deal with things relating to that blessed hope or the rapture. And let me begin by saying this. This past week, we received over 700 emails. In fact, one email had 27 different questions. Now, obviously, we as a small organization are not able to respond to so many questions. But we do our best to select some and respond. And we've been overwhelmed lately over the last few weeks because of the situation that the world is in with the coronavirus. People are watching more videos and praise God for that. And we're receiving more emails based upon perhaps the increased videos. But here's the statement that I usually get. People will say, I reject this concept, this doctrine. It's man-made because we do not find the word rapture in the Bible at all. Not in the old and not in the new. And that's partially true. Now, the reason why I say partially, it's true that if you go through the scripture, you don't find the word rapture. But you find the biblical word which this word rapture is is derived and let me explain it to you very carefully when we look for example of first thessalonians chapter 4 beginning with verses 13 through 18 you will find that paul speaks about an event we'll come to that and that section later on but paul mentions an event where he says that believers are going to be taken away, removed, or snatched away. And that Greek word is the word arpazo in its root form. Usually in Greek, we put the root form in the first person singular. So I, I do something. Arpazo is I take something away. I remove it quickly. It is snatched away very fastly. So in Latin, and the reason why I bring Latin into it is that, of course, Catholicism 
played a major role in the development of many of the theological terms. And Catholicism, the primary language is Latin. So when they translated the scriptures from Greek, and I'm speaking about the New Covenant, the New Testament, when they transferred them or translated them into Latin, this Greek word arpazo, they Latinize it, and that word is rapturo or something to that effect. And from rapturo, we get the anglicized version of it, rapture. So if someone says that word doesn't appear in the Bible, well, you could say the word, word church doesn't appear in the Bible because it's a word ecclesia, which is translated church. So it does. So the same way, the word rapture, well, that word doesn't because the New Testament is written in Greek, but the word that is translated into Latin and then into English where we get the concept rapture is indeed a biblical word. So it is an event, but how to understand it? What does it mean? I've received several emails, for example, where people were saying, you teach, and this is true, that the, the church will not go through the period of time where God's wrath is being poured out. That's true. The verse of scripture that I frequently quote is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, which says, God has not appointed you for wrath, but to obtain salvation. And several people wrote, but isn't God able to shelter us, to keep us from his wrath, and us still being in this body and in this world? He is. He could do that. But here's the question that needs to be answered. Does the scripture say that he's going to keep us in this body and in this world when the wrath of God is being poured out? Obviously, God's able to do that. He does that with Israel or a remnant of Israel. But does the scripture say that he's going to do that with believers? And we're going to look at some scriptures later on that I believe in each one of us. We have to make that own decision. If we believe that the scripture does in fact speak of an event prior to God's wrath where we're going to be removed bodily, not that we're going to be preserved or sheltered, but removed from this world. Again, God could keep us here and shelter us so his wrath would not affect us. But is that what the scripture says? Well, we're going to, as I said, explore some of these issues today in this study, and then also in our next video dealing with this series on the end times. Now, I want to begin by, by reviewing something. I mentioned, and in all those 700 emails or more, no one responded with a verse of Scripture. Remember what I asked? I made the statement, nowhere do we find in the word of God any verse of scripture that forbids, make it impossible for the church to enter into those final seven years. So often we hear the church won't be in the tribulational period, those last seven years. But as I shared with you, and I'm going to repeat now, the verse of scripture that they turn to is found in, in the book of Daniel and chapter 9. And they'll say this, the church was not in the first 69 weeks. That's true. It didn't exist. Because the first 69 weeks come to an end with the crucifixion. And therefore they say, because the church was not in the first 69 weeks, it can't be in the 70th. Who says? Why can't it? It is not logical. It is not truly a rational point of view to say because someone was not here for the first 69 events, they can't be for the 70th. They may well in fact be, and I gave an example in a previous video 
that supports this. So we have to make sure that how someone is utilizing the scripture is not based upon faulty logic. Now there's another thing that I said, and that is there's not one verse of scripture that people can turn to and say, all of those final 77, excuse me, all of those final seven years, the 70th week of Daniel. No one can say that these last seven years, what's commonly referred to as the tribulation period, consists of all God's wrath being poured out. Here again, I shared with you in this previous video that what people say is, well, bad things are happening. Therefore, it must be God's wrath. No, bad things can happen, really bad things, supernatural bad things can happen, and the source can be satanic. There's not one verse that says all of Daniel's 70th week, those last seven years, all of it consists of God's wrath. There's no verse of scripture that says that. So we need to, and I repeat this because it's important that we make doctrine not on just what we hear others say, what we read in books, but what we read in this book, the Word of God. Now, there's a few other things that need to be pointed out about this concept of the rapture or the blessed hope. The first thing that I want to dispel is another doctrine related to it, foundational to our blessed hope. And this is the doctrine that, that many have coined the doctrine of imminency, which means that the rapture is an imminent event, meaning it could happen any time. That there are no events, no prophetic uh, actions that have to happen before the rapture comes. It could happen even at this moment. So to support this, there's a doctrine called the doctrine of imminency. And the question that I pose to you, is that doctrine biblically sound? Now I have a, a friend. He is a man that I greatly respect. I look up to. I think he's very, very intelligent. And I believe he's well-versed in the Word of God. And I know that he loves the Lord with all of his heart. But that doesn't mean that everyone who has this great love and commitment for the Word of God is 100% right all the time. Obviously, we all, I make, you make, heirs in our understanding of the things of God. That's what these videos are for. So we grow together. And I wrote in this, this little booklet on our blessed hope, the rapture, I wrote a few pages dealing with this doctrine known as the doctrine of imminency. And what I did was this. My friend, he wrote an article and why he believed in this doctrine, and he gave at the end of it all these citations from the Bible, and there were many. Now, this is what I suggest you to do. I know several different organizations that they'll write something, they'll have their theological point of view, and they'll put so many scriptures to support it. You know what I like to do? I like to read all of those verses. And what I find so frequently is this, that many of those verses don't even really deal with the issue. They don't support the premise of their theological perspective and their, their view. And I believe that same thing can be said here. Now, don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. We are dependent upon this book as a book of truth, the standard. So what I like to do is to go through the several verses that he supplied and a few others to really answer the question, is the doctrine of imminency biblically sound? Is it truly a doctrine that comes from the scripture? And the two, verse, the two first verses that I like to give are, are known to all of us. 
It's written in the Gospels. No man knows the day or the hour that the Son of Man comes. And here's the logic that comes in. If I don't know the day or the hour, it could happen any time. My lack of knowledge means it could be any time. Well, that's totally illogical. That is not rational simply because I don't know. And you know what the scripture says? The angels don't know. Even the Son of Man does not know. Only the Father knows. But this does not mean that it can happen any time. In fact, let me give you the citation. Matthew 24, verse 44 says something similar. And I'll read it. And these are, are translated very literally by me from the Greek text where it says, On account of this, also you be prepared or ready. Because the hour you do not think the Son of Man comes. So it tells us here that the hour that the Son of Man comes, it's going to be surprising. And one of the things I would say is this, when we look at the parable of the ten virgins and the coming of the Son of Man, and here again, we're not talking about the second coming. We're talking about that blessed hope, the rapture. What the parable of the versions tell us is that we are going to be surprised. It's going to be delayed from our vantage point. We're going to hear people thinking, I thought it would have happened, that it would have already taken place, and it has not. So we need to be very careful in what we believe. So let me go through some of these, these verses that are offered up, and you decide. Does it truly speak about the rapture as an imminent event that could happen at any time even now? Here's a scripture that they give. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7. So that you do not lack in any gifts. So he says here, and the context is that we might be complete that we might be fully supplied to serve him. So he says, so that you do not lack in not one gift, but eagerly await for the appealing of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. So I should be eagerly waiting. But just because I'm told to wait and I'm eager, doesn't mean it can happen at any time. Let me give you an example. My wife... We have three children. And when she told me she was pregnant, I was excited. And I was eagerly awaiting for the birth of these children. But I didn't know the day or the hour. But the fact that I didn't know the day or the hour doesn't mean that my son or my daughter could be born just any time. I mean, she was just found out that she was pregnant. And, of course, we went to the, the physician, and he gave a due date. But as we all know, sometimes babies don't obey due dates. Our oldest came three weeks early, and the two other children came a few days late. So even though I had a due date from a physician, you know what that tells me? I still didn't know the day or the hour. So just not knowing the day or the hour doesn't mean it could happen anytime. Obviously, my, my wife, she had to go through the three trimesters. And even though a child might come early, if it's going to be a healthy delivery, certain things have to happen. And there are signs that lead up to that, that child being born. So simply not knowing the day or the hour doesn't mean it can be any time. And just because we're eagerly awaiting something, I gave this example not too long ago in another video, but my wife and I, we've been married 33 years. And we are eagerly awaiting, at least I am, for our 35th anniversary because we have something planned to celebrate this. But I know something. I'm eagerly awaiting that, but it doesn't mean that it can happen just any time because I'm eagerly awaiting. 
there's got to be the 34th before that. And after the 34th, 12 months, 365 days until I come to the 35th. So you can be unknowing. You can be eagerly awaiting something, but that does not mean that that event is imminent, that it can happen just any time. Let's move on to the next verse. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. And here again, these citations are not mine. They were written in an article by a very strong believer, a strong believer in Messiah Yeshua and a strong believer in the doctrine of imminency. What does it say here? Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship exists in heaven, from which also the Savior we are waiting for, the Lord Messiah Yeshua. Now, we are waiting for him, but does that mean that he can just come anytime because we're waiting for something? You know, oftentimes now we order a pizza. And I'm eagerly awaiting for that pizza to come. But I know something. That doesn't mean that it can just come anytime. I hang up the phone. They have to get out the dough, prepare it, put on the various uh, cheeses and 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 different things. They have to cook it. They have to take it out, put it in the box, cut it, and bring it here. So even though I'm eagerly awaiting, doesn't mean that it can come in a minute or any time. There's a process. Same thing. Let's move on to Philippians 4, 5. It says, your moderation, make known to all men, the Lord is near. Well, he's near. But just because something's near doesn't mean it can happen anytime. It's an encouragement to be faithful. But it doesn't mean today, tomorrow, something can be near but not imminent. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Whenever, and I like this, this gets it right, whenever the Messiah should be manifest, whenever, who is our life, then also you with him shall be manifested in glory. Now, this term, whenever, is important because not only does, and it's in the subjunctive, the subjunctive not only is a, a mood of, of uncertainty, but also it can show condition. So we can emphasize the conditional certain things, as we'll see in our next video must take place. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. We read here, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Yeshua, the one who delivered us from the coming wrath. Yes, we're waiting for him. And notice what it says. He's delivered us from the coming wrath. How? We'll come to that in a few minutes. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest. But the implication is, be awake, be alert, he says. But rather, let us watch and let us be sober. So watch for what? Why would it say watch unless there's something to see specifically that, that assists us in being ready and knowing how near the time is. You know, when it says the Lord is near, that word can also speak about speed, meaning when something happens, the result is going to come very quickly. But it does not necessarily mean that, that this process is close to happening. It just means when it begins, it'll take place very closely. Now, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, I Pick this one, and so did he, because it speaks specifically about the rapture. Looking, and this word looking means with expectation. For the blessed hope, this is this key verse, for the blessed hope, i.e. the rapture, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. This speaks about the divinity of Messiah's word, where it says the appearing of our great God and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. People have argued with me and said, well, appearing, God can appear and Messiah can appear. Here's the problem with that. 
This is the explanation of someone who does not rely upon the text because the word appearing is in the singular in the original language. Greek is very specific. If there's two who are appearing, then the word would have to be in the plural. But because we're talking about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Trinity, but the two, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one, or in this case, the two, God the Father, God the Son, one. It takes a singular word here, not plural. And then another one that people will, will, will quote is Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, and also 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, which says, For you perfectly know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief. Or here it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he, and now I'm quoting Revelation 16, verse 15, blessed is the one who's watching and keeping his garments in order that not naked will he walk and see the shame. His shame, meaning naked, no good deeds, therefore shame. But over and over we're told to watch. So something that's imminent that just happens in a, a blink of an eye, why would we be told to watch? We would just expect that. Well, we'll talk more about this in our next video, but what I want you to see is that this doctrine of the imminent return or rapture is not one based upon Scripture. One email that I received, it quoted a very well-known uh, Bible teacher from California, and the person, having read this book, said, well, help me out. What about the book of James, chapter 5. So let's turn there for a moment. The book of James and chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. I would encourage you to read that very, very carefully. James, chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 9. He was saying on an article that he read from this, this well-known Bible teacher that he gives this scripture for the doctrine of the immin imminency, meaning that the rapture can happen any time. Well, it's interesting because what this person does is simply quote the end of chapter 5, verse 9, where he says, Behold, the judge stands at the door. Now he says, does that not mean that it's imminent? He's at the door. Here's the problem. When you look at this, and this is what so frequently is done. People rip things out of context. They are so anxious to find some proof text that supports their views, they don't even pay attention to the context of the passage. If we look here, if you look at verse 7, in fact, we are told a few times to be patient. Isn't that interesting? And what this is speaking about is not so much the rapture. In fact, not at all the rapture. Because when Messiah comes, he's not coming for us as a thief. If you believe that he's coming for you as a thief, then you are a son of darkness. Because if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says concerning true believers that we are sons of the day, of the light that that day should not overtake us as a thief in the night. In fact, Revelation chapter 3 says, if you're watching and living out a repentive lifestyle, meaning turning to God and turning away from sin, it says that day won't appear for you as a thief in the night. We'll have that expectation. And here he says, in fact, if you look at verse 7, he says, Therefore, my brethren, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Then he says, look if you would, he refers again at the second half of verse 7. He says, be patient for the, the rain to come. Now, it talks here about the early rain and the latter rain. And what it means is this, someone who plants a, a, a field, shouldn't expect the harvest without first the early rains and the latter rains coming. But when it talks about a judge, the judge is at the door. 
Messiah's rapture is not him coming as a judge. The context here is what? The context is the second coming. When Messiah comes the second time, all the way to earth in the rapture, he's just going to meet us in the clouds, in the sky. But when he comes the second time, he's coming to judge this earth. And what James is saying is, be persevered, remain faithful, have patience. In fact, he tells us in verse 8 of this passage, he says, let your hearts be strong or established. So we're supposed to persevere in light of what? The injustice that's in this world. Knowing that very soon things can happen and the second coming will take place. But obviously much has to happen for the second coming. But realize what we're taught here is this. That the events of the last days, they could happen in any generation. But they haven't yet. But there's clear signs to the last days. And although, and I said earlier, I believe that there are indicators, there are signs today that things are converging upon a very specific and important prophetic time. What's that? The birth pains that Messiah spoke of. But we are not yet in the birth pains. I gave the reason why in the earlier message, so you can look at this, but we are not yet there. But there is evidence, scripturally based, when we look at this world, to believe that we're fastly approaching that time. Well, I want to respond now to something I, I spoke earlier about, and that is, even though Messiah, is able to keep us in this body and in this world and shelter us from his wrath, is that the way that we should think of not being recipients of his wrath, still in this world, still in this body, rather than in the kingdom of heaven? And I would suggest to you that this is not the way that we should think of it, but we should believe and expect to be rapidly removed from this world prior to, immediately before, the wrath of God falls. And the piece of scripture that I would like for us to go to is 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Now, first of all, this, this passage is about the resurrection. First and foremost, the resurrection of Messiah. But we see that the, the rapture, our blessed hope, is, is similar to a resurrection. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But looking and make a note of this because this has strong implications for what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And that is when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this famous resurrection chapter, we see that twice, two times, Messiah is called in Hebrew, Rashid. In Greek, it's the same concept of Rashid, which means the first. Now, what we find is this, and this is very important. Not too long ago, we, we, we celebrated the, the resurrection day. And I have mentioned many times that Messiah rose from the dead within a special time frame. That is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was crucified on Passover. And then the resurrection happened, took place on the first day of the week after Shabbat had ended. He rose, and that day, and the reason why Paul calls him twice what is usually translated into English as the first fruits. Why? Because there was a specific context for viewing the rapture. There is a biblical commandment to count 50 days or seven full weeks plus one day, and seven full weeks plus one day is 50. And we know something. We begin that count on what's called Rashid, the first. We begin the count on the term that means the first, the first day of counting. That is the day that Messiah rose from the dead has to be on the first day of the week after the Sabbath. 
The next thing we know is at the end of this period of time is Pentecost or Shavuot. Pentecost being 50, count 50 days. Or Shavuot, count seven weeks. The term Shavuot is weeks. What we find, and remember this point, it's going to be significant in a moment. The harvest that begins on that first counting is the barley harvest. Some say wheat harvest, and we can go into great deal, detail about it, but for the sake of this example, it's not necessary to, to really detail barley or, or harvest. There's a period of harvest, everyone agrees about this, for seven weeks. Messiah is the first fruit. And what are we? We are called the rest of the harvest. So as Messiah rose from the dead bodily in a new body, in a different condition, we too have that same hope. And that, that resurrection comes within the context of victory, of a fulfillment of promise, and a sharing of that, that promise with Messiah's followers. So that harvest takes place over a period of seven weeks. Now, Messiah is the first fruit. We are the rest of the harvest. Remember that. And that harvest is done every day, of course, not on Shabbat, but every day other than Shabbat for those seven full weeks. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read something. We read that there are many different types of bodies. The scripture speaks about uh, bodies that birds have, bodies that fish have, bodies that animals have, bodies that are celestial, meaning the stars and the sun, the moon. And each body is different. Why? Because of their habitation. Birds, part of their habitation is in the sky. They fly from tree to tree. Fish swim. Fish have one type of body that's designed for water. Birds have another for flying. And what Paul is telling us here in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, that we are going to receive a body, a body that is designed for the kingdom of God. And he tells us that within this 15th chapter that speaks of the rapture. Now, what does he say specifically about it? Well, look with me, if you would, to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to begin in verse 50. He says this, This I say to you, brethren, that, that flesh and blood are not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor can that which is corruptible inherit that which is not corruptible. Verse 51, he says, Behold a mystery. Remember how we began. The rapture is a mystery. Behold a mystery, I say to you. Behold, not all of us will sleep, meaning we're not all going to die. But all of us are going to be changed. And if you keep reading, he talks about a change that is coming. And this change, this mystery is that this body, is going to be changed in an instant. Now, remember what I talked about in the previous video. There is no such thing as soul sleep. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. When someone dies, in fact, we have scriptural testimony of those who were dead and they had consciousness. They, they spoke. They understood things. They could hear. They could comprehend. So nowhere do we see anyone sleeping, their souls are asleep. No. When a believer dies, in that instant that they die, immediately they go to be with the Lord. And, and Paul says, comfort one another with these things. But the body of that departed loved one, their souls are in heaven if they're a believer with Messiah. But their body is put into the tomb. Or whatever happens to the body, it's not really important. No matter what happens, that body decays and it turns to ashen. But at the time of the rapture, it is going to be transformed. Any believer who have died, their body, their souls are in the heaven with Messiah. 
but their bodies are going to be transformed into a glorious new body designed for the kingdom. And those bodies are going to rise up to meet, this is what the scripture says, to meet the Lord in the air and be reunited with that person's soul. So there's a reunification between that new body and that soul. And the scripture says, we who are still alive, we are going to be changed as well. We're going to see our bodies transform. We who are still alive and believers, we're going to be taken up. And that's why it's so important that we read what the scripture says. Now, I mentioned 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go there very briefly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what the Word of God says clearly in this passage of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He speaks this as a way of encouragement to the reader, and he says this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We begin with verse 13. He says, concerning those who are asleep, brethren, meaning those who have died, I do not want you to be deceived, misled, or under, under, not understanding. That's why some are sad today because they have no hope. But we have a hope. Look at verse 14. For we believe that Messiah died and lived. He was resurrected. And thus, God will bring, by means of Messiah Yeshua, also those who are asleep with him. Now, this is an important concept. It says, we who are asleep with him. Do you think Messiah is asleep right now? Sleeping on the job? Supposed to be at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us? No, no, he's asleep. Of course he's not. This is a great example of, Those who are asleep simply means dead. Why do we say that? Because those who die in faith have an expectation of getting up. So sleeping, when you go to sleep, you have an expectation of rising up after that nap in the morning, whenever. And so it was traditional in Judaism to always speak of the dead in the term sleep, reminding people of the resurrection. So Messiah is not soul sleeping, and neither are other dead who die in the Lord. Look at verse 15. For this we say to you by by the word of the Lord, for we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not uh, precede those who are asleep, meaning dead. For he himself, the Lord, he will descend from heaven, with a shout, with the sound and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Then those who are dead will rise first in Messiah. And afterwards, we who are still alive, we will be snatched away. There's that verse, verse 17. There's that word, arpazo. Then we will be snatched away. This is speaking of the rapture, the blessed hope. We will be taken away together in the clouds. That's why I say, is God able to keep us here during the time his wrath is being poured out? Yes, he could. But the word of God doesn't support that. It says very clearly, we will be taken with those who have already died. Their bodies, their souls are in heaven. We will be taken together with them in the clouds. Why? To meet the Lord where? In the sky. So that's why. I do not believe that that we are going to be here in this body, in this world, when the wrath is poured out. No, we're going to be removed, taken away, snatched away, quickly removed. And we're going to meet him in the air prior to the wrath of God falling. Now, there's one more thing that I want to deal with before we conclude, and that is this. People will point out in Revelation chapter 20, believe in verse 5, it speaks about the first resurrection. And there are those who say this. They will say that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation period. This is not the case. They'll say that, that yes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, very important verse, write this down. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, which says, when we, when Messiah returns, and this is the second coming, we will be coming with him. So 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13 says, when Messiah comes the second time, not speaking about the rapture, we will be with him. Now, some will say the rapture and the second coming are simultaneously. That means the rapture will happen, we'll meet the Lord in the air, and then we'll come with him. But that means that we were here for the wrath of God. And the scripture says, no, that we will be taken prior to the wrath of God. And they will say, but the first resurrection is after the seven years, that final 70th week of Daniel. Well, here's what I would say to that. We need to remember something. The book of Revelation writes as a priority to those who are going to be alive during the events of the book of Revelation. That is something very important in order to interpret it properly. And this is what John is saying. John is saying is this, those who lose their life during this time of intense persecution in the last days, they are, are not going to miss out on anything. They are the focus of the book of Revelation to encourage disciples who are alive at that time. Now, we need to realize something. Those who re remain faithful, persevered, true during this time of, of tribulation. Remember, we're talking not about the wrath of God, but satanic tribulation. They will take part in the rapture too. So all believers who come to faith before the wrath of God is poured out will take part in the rapture. But this is the problem that they present. They'll say, but the first resurrection it takes place at the end of the seven years. And we believe the rapture takes place prior to that. Some will say before the seven years. I will say before the wrath of God comes within that period of seven years. No man knows the day or the hour. But here's what we need to remember. The scripture tells us Messiah is the first fruit. And we are the rest of the harvest. That rest of the harvest is over a period of time. People are going to be in the millennial kingdom that take place no matter when they come to faith. Those who take part in the rapture, but also those, those who come to faith after the rapture, those of the Jewish people. And I believe there's going to be a remnant of the nations based upon Zechariah 14 that also come to faith after the rapture. And they are going to be part of the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, that are going to rule and reign with him during that thousand years of the millennial kingdom when Messiah rules from Jerusalem for those thousand years. And what he's saying is the first resurrection are all those who are going to rule and reign with Messiah. So we should not anticipate simply a special resurrection in Agreement with the rapture at the end of those seven years. No, there's going to be the rapture prior to the wrath of God falling and those who come to faith after of Israel and those of the Gentiles that come to faith but nevertheless lose their life during that period of time. God will also resurrect them and all those who take place in the millennial kingdom as believers. They are known as part of the first resurrection. So it's very important that we see what the scripture says about this rapture, about the first resurrection, all of this seen as an event that happens in stages. Now the rapture, and I'm going to close with this. The rapture is not in stages. It's a one-time event that happens like that. When? Prior to prior to the wrath of God falling. But there will be people, primarily of Israel, that come to faith after the rapture, and they will be part of the body of believers 
that, that populate the millennial kingdom. And all those who are, are in the millennial kingdom, whether they took part in the rapture or came to faith after, they who have died will be resurrected. And all believers are, are part of that first resurrection. Everyone, those in the rapture, those who were resurrected after the rapture, in the, after the last seven years, all of that collectively is known as the first resurrection. So my hope is that, that this clarified some of the questions that we've received. And here's what we're going to do in our next video. And this video is an exciting one that we're going to be doing because we're going to be speaking about the revealing of the Antichrist and the rapture. Those two events are inherently related. I want to say that again. The revealing of the Antichrist and the rapture. And we're going to look primarily at just a few verses. Now, in this lesson, we covered a lot of Scripture. We did so very quickly. But in the next video, we're going to cover just a handful of verses. But we're going to do so very carefully and specifically so that you can understand the relationship between the revealing of the Antichrist and the occurrence of our blessed hope, the rapture. And let me just share with you that, that I'm writing a new book on just that event, the revealing of the the Antichrist. That's one of the things that I'm concentrating on now when we cannot travel and we are kind of uh, in time out, so to speak, during this coronavirus. So anyway, I hope that this video will benefit you. We thank you for, for viewing it. We appreciate those who, who are so kind and generous, who pray for us and support us in many different ways. And that's why we wanted to do these series of videos on the last days. May God richly bless you. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.